Hi, welcome everyone. Does it work? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, we are very pleased to welcome Professor Soman Nigam uh, from the University of Maryland uh, as today's speaker. And so, we um, will try to hear. So, you know, our, our deal is here also, and then we are, SOMAS is looking for a new name for itself. Uh, to represent the diversity of expertise that we have. So the program that Dr. Nigam comes from uh, is called Atmospheric, Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences and Earth System Science, University of Maryland. Um, so in terms of uh, his background, so Dr. Nigam uh, did his undergraduate work in physics at the Indian Institute of technology in Kanpur, in India, of course, and then for his graduate studies, he came to the U.S. and he did his Ph.D. at Princeton University, and his advisor was Isaac Helm, uh, the well-known atmospheric dynamicist. And uh, before joining the faculty at the University of Maryland, he was director of, uh, of the large-scale dynamic meteorology program at the National Science Foundation. Um, and then in more recent years, uh, Dr. Nigam has been working with the U.S. State Department as a Jefferson Fellow for the National Academy of Sciences, where uh, so, uh, the, the people who are chosen for this work, they work with the State Department and advise them in the implementation of scientific ideas or scientific applications to the, the U.S. policy in different countries. And so Dr. Nigam has worked in a large number of areas in climate science, uh, using both observational data analysis, theoretical frameworks, and climate modeling, and many, many areas in monsoons in Asia, in, in America, uh, atmosphere, ocean uh, interactions, something he will speak on today, uh, drought in the US, and sea ice loss uh, in the North Atlantic and many other topics. So please visit his website to see the range of his work. And he has been received many, many honors. I would mention just a couple of them. So back in 2003, he was elected as a, as a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society in London. And then a few years later, in 2006, he was elected as a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. And for the past four years, four years he has been chairman of the Committee on Climate Variability and Change for the American Meteorological Society. So let us welcome Dr. Sohan. Well, thank you, Sultan, for that introduction. Uh, this is perhaps my second or third visit here. Uh, over a very long time, so I don't remember the number. I first came here, and Marvin Geller was uh, either the dean or the director of ITPA. And uh, some of the faculty I met were just arriving at that time. Duane Walliser was here, for those of you who know him. Uh, he was there. So that's my time benchmark. He was getting ready to leave, or he had ju just arrived. Uh, uh, in any case, I'm happy to be back and speaking on a subject on which I have normally not written. So I am not an oceanographer. I was driven to this area uh, for reasons I will tell you what got me interested in this topic. My background is climate dynamics uh, and uh, the previous work on oceans was related to ocean atmosphere interaction in the tropical basins uh, and El, El Nino and the seasonal cycles. and and stratus clouds uh, in the eastern basins and how the coupled ocean atmosphere land interaction plays out there. This is the kind of work that George Philander and others motivated us uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, anyway, the reason, first of all, my uh, uh, collaborators here, uh, Alfredo Ruiz Baradas is a former student from 2000 and he has continued to be with us. He's a research associate professor at the university, and he and I col collaborate a lot on 
problems of droughts. And given his thesis was on Atlantic Ocean atmosphere interaction, among the first papers to talk about the Atlantic dipole, etc. Uh, so he's uh, on this. Leon Shefik was a postdoc from University of Bergen visiting NASA and the University of Maryland, and we got him interested in this problem. He himself was uh, thinking about the AMO and the North Atlantic Oscillation, working with Serpia Hakkinen at, at NASA. So those are the, the study is published in 2018 uh, in the Journal of Climate. So the outline uh, is as follows. Uh, the decadal pulses of the, in the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation are the focus of attention here. And the first topic, uh, the first bullet is what is it and why do we care about them? As I told you, I didn't seek to do this. I was driven to this and I'm, that's the part here. Uh, this is my learning about the Atlantic Basin. Uh, uh, looked at the bathymetry, looked at the overview of pertinent circulation ocean atmosphere features that will play a role in the story that I will uh, uh, tell you today. And then we talk about, uh, this is the crux of the talk, subtropical subpolar water exchanges during Gulf Stream excursions uh, as obtained from examination of the state of the art ocean analysis. This is the EN4 data set that the UK Met Office or Hadley Center has put out. And we will then examine here how the Gulf Stream excursions which are, which will appear or which will soon, it will be evident that they are connected to the decadal pulses that are the goal of the study, how they lead and lag versus low frequency NAO and AMO pulses. And then finally, I hope to put together and convey a mechanistic hypothesis for these, uh, for the decadal pulses that are, uh, that, that are the goal here. So AMO, for, so the first two or three slides are introductory in the way to sort of engage the students here, those who are still not up to speed with AMO, Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. It represents, and so you'll see the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation in the background. Uh, these are sea surface temperature anomalies countered at 0 0.1 degrees. So in the North Atlantic, temperatures can be around 0 0.3. The Atlantic multidecadal oscillation or multidecadal variability in the middle and high latitude basin, and it's evident in the surface and subsurface temperatures. The tropical basin also plays a part. As you can see, the sort of temperature perturbation come down. And although this this comes first and then the tropical part develops. So it's not in unison. It is not a standing oscillation. The variability time scale ranges from five to eight decades, depending on the kind of smoothing that you do on the index. And I'll tell you about the index in a minute. The unsmooth record has notable decadal pulses. The historical name AMO, so Meteorologists and climate scientists knew about the oscillation from the late 1980s or 70s, even earlier maybe, but we didn't have a name for it. And Richard Kerr, uh, the size, oh, that's on the next strong print. Uh, the, name, the name was given by a science correspondent, a correspondent writing for the science magazine, Richard Kerr, who many of you know. Uh, he gave us, he, he coined this name, Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. I say the name is a little misleading because it emphasizes the multi-decadal parts at the expense of the decadal pulses, perhaps. Variability amplitude, I already pointed out, is around 0.3 degrees. Uh, who identified and named it? Uh, I already answered that question a little bit. Not Gilbert Walker, after whom all the oscillations, or many of the oscillations are named, uh, beginning with the North Atlantic Oscillation, North Pacific, Southern Oscillation. If it is not Walker, it must be Bjerknes. <laughs> Jacob Bjerknes noted the surface warming. So this paper in 1964 is a seminal paper in Atlantic multidecadal variability. Bjerknes noted the surface warming in the North Atlantic in 1910s and 20s and connected it to the northward surges of the Gulf Stream. Not at the same time, N not contemporaneous surges, uh, but 
uh, this is the first uh, reference here. Uh, Schlesinger and Raman Kuti, 1994, are the first ones to write about the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation as an oscillation. I think this paper is in science. And Kushner uh, also is wrote about this oscillatory nature of the warming and observations. Delbert, Manabi, and Stauffer are perhaps the first to report the oscillations presence in a couple simulation. And the oscillation was given its name by Richard Kerr in 2000. After that, we have been calling it AMO. Uh, David Enfield at NOAA's AOML laboratories is a popular citation for AMO's hydroclimate impact. So these are the common indices that are used to describe AMO. And the most common is the NOAA's AMO index, which is after Enfield's uh, index, which is nothing but the average temperature of the Atlantic Basin north of the equator between like 70 and 0, or, or the, the, the Atlantic Basin north of the equator till 60 or 70 degrees. Just take the temperature and the anomaly, and that is the blue curve here, the, the blue and the red shades. NOAA's AMO index, unsmooth. Now you begin to see the decadal pulses. A swarm of pulses, about two or three, in each multi-decadal phase. What most people in climate science uh, plot is the smooth AMO index. This also NOAA puts out, the dashed black line here, much smoother, and it's obtained by a running mean of 41. So the, the, the original index is seasonal, and then you do a 41 season running average, and you generate uh, this line. And now it is devoid of decadal pulses. It has one big oscillation, and then maybe another one coming. In the instrumented period, maybe one and a half oscillations, consistent with the, seven, with the seven 50 to 80 year time scale of the oscillation. So those are those two. If I do a smoothing of the data, not a 41 year running mean, but something called low smoothing that some of you employ in smoothing time series. This is uh, local, uh, est locally estimated uh, scatter plot smoothing. And 15 means local smoothing. So 15% of the data record is used to generate a local smoother. It's, it's, a, it's a standard function available in MATLAB, for example, for smoothing. And so that is shown with this thick black line. And you will see that it is capturing the decadal pulses, and uh, not only there, elsewhere, and so on. And uh, the red curve here is a principal component obtained from sea surface temperature analyses of seasonal anomalies or from 1900 to 2016. And the key, a key attribute of this analysis is the use of extended EOFs. That means I'm not, in regular EOFs, you look for the most common map. Out of 100 maps, that's your first EOF. In extended EOFs, you look for a most common sequence of maps. So you're paying attention to both spatial recurrence as well as temporal recurrence, spatial temporal recurrence in data. So it's more evolution targeting analysis. And so once you do that, without knowing anything about the AMO, and that analysis brings out the PDO also, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, El Nino. You don't have to filter the data. You don't have to uh, ban pass the data, and so on. It captures all that because it's checking for spatial variability, uh, for temporal variability as well, in any case. Uh, that analysis, we published this in 2008 uh, in Journal of Climate, and that was updated here. And the red one is the principal component, and you see those nicely capturing the decadal pulses. Highly smooth AMO indices highlight multi-decadal variability at the expense of constituent decadal pulses. Now, this one oceanographers know about. The North Atlantic, especially the subpolar basin, was fresh and cold. And there was a massive discharge of uh, water from the subaltic basin to the uh, subpolar uh, basin. And this is called the great salinity anomaly. 
In fact, in 2008, when we did the principal component analysis, we were worried about whether this analysis was capturing a statistically an artifact, you know, of these the peaks, or is there really some phenomena that can give us credible, you know, uh, confidence that the analysis is capturing the right thing? And uh, in that paper in 2008, we, uh, 2009, we refer to the great salinity anomaly as a benchmark that the analysis needs to pick out on its own without even knowing salinity, just space-time analysis of sea surface temperature. So this is the great salinity anomaly here, nicely captured both by in the, in the AMO index as well as in the principal components. Why do we care about the decadal pulses here? So for example, in this negative phase of the AMO, the cold phase of the Atlantic, there's a swarm of three pulses. And here you can see one, two, and maybe more. And again, in the recent period, I see one, two, and three. So these pulses stand out. It's like synoptic weather and climate. Uh, you know, on multi-decadal time scale, you have these decadal pulses. Is there a rectified impact in generating multi-decadal variability? So that's a question in its own right. But more immediately, are these pulses of consequence, societal consequence? And so here is an example of the hydroclimate impact. By hydroclimate, I mean both precipitation, surface air temperature, drought indices, and so on. So this is, we take 115 years of data, do regressions of the AMO principal component on precipitation both in, over both continents on either side of the Atlantic Basin. So when the AMO is in the warm phase, it leads to significant precipitation deficits over the central and southern Great Plains and more rainfall over Sahel. These are well-known things. Uh, in a 2011 paper, we showed that major droughts and wet events in the 20th century are linked much more to the Atlantic Basin than to the Pacific as was previously thought. For example, if I take this red box and plot the average precipitation deficit every year or every season over the 20th century. I'll show you that in the next figure. And you will see that the AMO is implicated both, is implicated also in the Dust Bowl drought of the 1930s. So AMO is uh, impacted, uh, impacts precipitation and hydroclimate on both sides. So it's very important to know. If I plot the precipitation surplus or deficit in this box, that's plotted by browns and greens. This is the big dust bowl of the 1930s and 40s. This is another drought of the 1950s. This was a shorter lived drought, but more intense. And then the wet periods of the 1980s. This is, these are well-known hydroclimate episodes in the 20th century. On top of that is, so that is real data from uh, GPCC or CRU, uh, sorry, GPCC. This is from a paper of ours in uh, GRL 2011. And on top of that is the SST principal component for the AMO. And you can see the out of phase correlation for every decadal episode. And the negative correlation is 0.75. So that is one reason why the decadal pulses are important to understand and as to their origin and genesis that they matter. So let me then move to the Atlantic Basin and begin to uh, sort of delve in the talk. Uh, as I said, uh, this was perhaps my first sort of un deep analysis of the Atlantic. And uh, I was naturally curious about the bathymetry because in the atmosphere, we, all, we know the flow over mountains is very important. And, uh, and so, uh, dynamics is uh, important. So this is actually a famous painting. Uh, this guy was a, uh, some of you may have heard his name, he was a very famous cartographer and uh, painter, sculptor. And so he sort of, this is some rendition, a painting off at, of the seafloor in the Atlantic. And the important features are the mid-Atlantic ridge, sort of, sort of snaking around. And in our context of the subpolar basin, we have the Labrador Basin, 
the Arminger Basin, this is the Newfoundland Basin, and this is the Grand Banks. All these are important features, as you will see, in Gulf Stream sort of excursion and evolution. So flow normally comes around here, skirts the Grand Banks, and enters the Newfoundland Basin. More pertinent to the discussion today is the, the interruption in the mid-Atlantic ridge between Azores and Iceland, somewhere here. This is called the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone. It's about 2,000 kilometers of east-west connectivity across the basin here. And you will see that these are important pathways for water to go from the eastern, from the western to the eastern basin. And uh, the uh, anything else? And, and then, of course, you see uh, Iceland is here. And again, you will see pathways for current. The East Greenland current is up there and, and so on. I could have used that. This is a small, uh, this is a brief description of the ocean atmosphere circulation in the North Atlantic, in the subpolar basin or the North Atlantic basin beginning around 30 degrees north. And let's start off with the atmospheric features first. This is the, uh, the climatological, all season average from NCEPRI analysis, the low pressure in the northern basin, uh, typically referred to as Icelandic low in winter time. And this is the Bermuda high or the Azores high. So this is a 1,002 hectopascals. This is 1,020. These are actual values just plotted schematically here. This is the jet stream from NCEPRI analysis, 200 millibar isotac analysis. That's the climatological feature, again, averaged over all seasons, not just winter. But that's the jet stream. The lighter lines, these white lines, are the, the uh, sea surface height contours. Cl again, climatological from Evasio altimetry altimetry and uh, they are counted 0.1 apart uh, uh, 0.1 meters apart and uh, on top of that of course are the current systems the Gulf Stream which is tracking here the gradients of the height is in pink and it's continuous the North Atlantic current and the Norwegian Atlantic current and then part of the current of course again you can see how the orography or the Barimetry is important. This is the mid-Atlantic ridge. This is the Charlie Gibb fracture zone. That's where the current goes across. And then this part of the current actually follows the ridge again, finds the opening, comes around. When I first started looking at the Atlantic Basin, I was sort of struck as to how the current sort of goes around Greenland and comes back. And it's only after plotting the barimetry that things start to sort of uh, uh, fall in place as to the, the, the pass of the current. So this is the Arminger current. It's a warm, salty water coming, breaking off from the North Atlantic and returning. This is the Arminger Basin. And then uh, the Labrador current comes up here, goes around the Green, Grand Banks and stuff. Uh, this is the East Greenland current, comes very close to Greenland. And that's all I had to say. And this is the Baffin current or the Davis, uh, I forget the name. This is Baffin Island and Labrador Sea and the Davis Strait somewhere here and this is the Baffin Bay. This is also will be part of the story uh, that will uh, unfold. Okay. So this, the, this is the figure I showed you earlier. The new figure here is the Gulf Stream Index on which Sultan, Chris Wolf, and others here are experts. I mean, the, the 2016 paper that Sultan wrote was sort of uh, guided some of our uh, earlier analysis here. And lately, the two papers that came out here, uh, they know about the North Wall much more than, I guess, anybody else, certainly much more than me. So here, we are on safe grounds by using Joyce's index, uh, uh, which is based on the location of the 15 degree isotherm at 200 meters depth. And so the, so the Gulf Stream is meandering, and the north flank of the Gulf Stream, there's a temperature front. 
or the temperature ribbon, which has a lot of temperature isotherms going uh, through it. And then the center of that ribbon is where the 15 degree isotherm lines lies. And Joyce has used the location of that in within 25 degrees of the off coastal region to develop an index that gives you approximately whether or that tells you whether the Gulf Stream is either moving north or south, is it displaced. The displacement is very small, maybe a degree or maybe just about that or less. So this is the Gulf Stream index. This is normalized and it's plotted. The data that was given to us by Joyce begins in 1954, ends in 2013. So that is the data limit here. And you will see it has decadal pulses too. You will also notice that when the Gulf Stream is north, northward extended, then the, the AMO is in the cold phase. Even here, where the Gulf Stream is north, AMO is in the cold phase relative to the multi-decadal thing. So once we take the multi-decadal component out of the AMO, it will Line, both of these lines will be similarly placed that the Atlantic, the subpolar Atlantic is cold when the Gulf Stream is not fully displaced. The, uh, the Gulf Stream's northward excursion is nearly coincident with the cold subpolar gyre. For somebody who hadn't studied this, I was thinking the Gulf Stream is going north, it's taking warm water with it. How come the subpolar gyre is cold? So it took some time to sort of come to terms with this. <laughs> uh, so how do I extract the decadal pulses from the AMO signal? That was the next task. And we floundered here for some time, didn't know quite what was the best strategy. Should we do bandpass filtering, Fourier decomposition, what? Now, those of you who have studied atmospheric wave propagation know that if I have the geopotential height and I want to either focus on meridional propagation of Rossby waves or zonal, I know that taking the derivative ha helps. If I take the zonal derivative, I'm emphasizing the smaller scales. If I take the zonal derivative of geopotential, I get meridional winds. So if I look at meridional wind anomalies, I will <coughs> visually begin to see more of the zonal wave propagation. And if I do take the meridional derivative, then I'll begin to see more of the other. So in the same spirit, uh, sorry, in the, in the same spirit, I simply took a derivative of the AMO thing so that it would bring out the shorter time scales. And I'm sort of scared of filtering. I don't know the statistics that well. So it's just easy to take the derivative and see what happens. If you take the derivative, Gulf Stream, in, sorry, uh, AMO tendency, and that is in red. So AMO tendency is now simply picking out all the decadal pulses. And the background AMO, AMO multi-decadal signal is gone out of the time series. And now these are all normalized indices. And there are three indices plotted here. And one is the Gulf Stream Index, which is in black because it is one of the main circulation features in the basin. The other is the low frequency NAO. And I'll describe that in a minute. And then it is the AMO tendency. Now, if I'm plotting the AMO tendency there, then the decadal pulses must be in lag quadrature. It's like a sine cosine function uh, on decadal time scale. So it's so if the, uh, I'll, I'll, if the AMO tendency is in red and the idealized AMO decadal pulse will be lag quadrature, so that there is a shift of about two and a half years because of the decadal time scale. And we'll show that a little more formally in a minute. Uh, I can first point out. Now look at the swarm of four pulses since the 1970s. So the, this is, the, for example, the Gulf Stream. First northward surge, another one, another one, and another one. This, we haven't done anything to the data. This is Joyce's data, except it's detrended and smooth. And if you look at the low frequency NAO, which is 
take the Harrell NAO index, which is a monthly index, make seasonal indices out of it, and then do the lows 15 smoothing. We are not the first ones to talk about low frequency component of the NAO. It's widely discussed in the literature. Uh, but here is, we are doing things consistently using the lows 15 time series. Now you can see for every northward excursion, there's a low frequency NAO preceding that. Now this is three years, so this difference is about a year and a half or a year. You see it here, see it here, see the difference here, and the, the difference between here and so on. For all the recent pulses, the low frequency NAO is leading the Gulf Stream. Not a new finding, Sultan had already written about it, as had others before, that there's a one or two year lead of low frequency NAO on the Gulf Stream. The AMO tendency is lagging, on the other hand, lagging here, lagging here, lagging here, and the lag is about three years because of the, this is three years, so you can estimate that. And we'll compute the lag formally, but this is just to eyeball. And well, here I'm just noting, low frequency NAO leads Gulf, Gulf Stream by about 1.5 years. Gulf Stream leads AMO tendency by three years. If it's leading AMO tendency by three years, it must be leading AMO by five years because of the quadrature lag. Ten years is the oscillation time scale. Five years is the opposite phase. That is completely in sync with what I showed you earlier, that when the Gulf Stream is north, the subpolar gyre is in the cold state. Okay, now comes a busy figure and I hope you can see some of it from the, uh, from the, from the back seats. What we have done here is use the EN 4.2 data set, uh, ocean analysis, uh, which is available for a long time, but we chose to focus on the 1954 onwards period, uh, the, mo the modern part of the record, also because the Gulf Stream Index is available to us for this period. We take the Gulf Stream Index which we believe mediates the lead of the low frequency NAO, then comes Gulf Stream one and a half years later, a northward surge of the Gulf Stream, and then the, the warm gyre state, the AMO comes, AMO's decadal pulse comes later. So the Gulf Stream is mediating, in a way, the instigation by the low frequency NAO and the realization of a whole gyre scale impact. So we take the Gulf Streams Index and do regression, or, do, or regress the EN4 data on the Gulf Stream Index. So over about 46 and 12, 50, 59 years of data here. Now, I will show you first the regressions. So four fields have been regressed, sea surface temperature, salinity, upper ocean salinity, 5 to 315 meters, and heat content, same depth, upper ocean, and then deep ocean heat content. We focus first on the upper ocean heat content because the Gulf Stream Index is defined using a 200, mil 200 meter depth. So to be consistent with the definition of the Gulf Stream Index, we first look at the heat content, upper ocean heat content. And you first write off C, and time is running down. These maps are at intervals of two years. T minus 4, T minus 2, simultaneous T plus 2, T plus 4, about a 9 year expanse in time. This oscillation is around 10 years, so we are trying to encompass the whole, one whole cycle if you will. And you start off, first you look at the simultaneous regressions of the Gulf Stream Index and not surprisingly the index, the regressions are most robust contemporaneously. And in these maps, we plot the subpolar gyre using dynamic heights, subtropical gyre, and this is an intermediate value that tracks the North Atlantic current. So this is, I think, a minus 0.4 meters, or this is plus 0.4, this is minus 0.1. So it's tracking uh, approximately the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic current. These are plotted. These are exactly the same contours are plotted on every panel. So you can see the position of the Gulf Stream and other features 
as to how they evolve in time. And so the interesting thing to watch here is first the Gulf Stream seems like a pretty continuous element here. At t minus 2 years in the upper ocean, you see intrusion of subpolar water along the Grand Banks entering the Newfoundland Basin and seemingly splitting the Gulf Stream into two. And we refer to this as an eastern detachment. Normally, when you talk about Gulf Stream detachment, the context is the separation from the coastline, the continent, North American continent. But here, the detachment uh, is with respect to uh, in-basin feature. So here, the Gulf Stream seems to s at least split into two or is pinched into two, uh, something. And that grows in time. The water is becoming a little more deeper and further and so on. And if I go to the deeper ocean, I see the split almost at the same time, even in the deep ocean heat content. And now you see much more penetration here, really lopping off an uh, eastern section. Now, I'm perhaps being a little heretic here. I've not found a single paper once when we started writing this paper about the Gulf Stream breaking up into a piece at the eastern end. At least we didn't find. So, uh, the, and, and this is data. So this is uh, not a model or anything. Now, the data could be suspect, but this is the best analysis we know but of. Where are you getting this deep, deep data, this deep water column data, or TNS? Where is that coming from? The EN4 analysis is of all the collected hydrographs that go into an ocean reanalysis project at the UK Met Office. That we understand, at least I, my understanding, talking to oceanographers here, it's a one degree data set. It, and it's perhaps the best foot forward. There's some uncertainties, of course, but, but, but that's what. And you see that. Now, you could say temperature soundings are bad. You can see that in the upper level salinity field, the break off of the section here. Fresh Arctic water, subpolar water is showing up in the upper ocean salinity field as well. And so this sort of goes on. And not only that, you will see in the deeper waters particularly that this section that's getting pinched off here is further getting bisected here. And this is leakage of subpolar water from the Charlie Gibbs fracture zone. You can lay it on top, and that is exactly the place where that happens. So the Gulf Stream, as it becomes, uh, so it starts off with a pretty sort of uh, not monolithic, but you know, sort of well-connected structure, and then is getting pinched off here, getting uh, split off here with a further bifurcation up here, not bifurcation, further sort of leakage of water in the uh, Charlie Gibbs zone. And uh, we have now two segments. Uh, why did I look at the surface? At surface, the ocean surface is exposed to a full spectrum of atmospheric forcing and a lot of reddening, related reddening. So if you're looking for a spatio-temporal evolutionary signal, sea surface temperature is the wrong place to begin, or at, at least. You must still circle back, but it's the wrong place to get started. That was the motivation to first look subsurface where ocean dynamics and coherent structures might be trackable in some sense. Uh, the fate of uh, these parcels is also interesting. Uh, for example, uh, I must uh, move more quickly. The, the parcels, uh, so, so, so this blob of water is getting dissected. And if I look, for example, here, it's getting uh, one of the segment gets sort of uh, beginning to get entrained into the subpolar gyre on the eastern flank of it. And in both, uh, especially uh, the upper surface, you see that uh, right here. And there are other telltale features as well here and then getting up here. But you can, you can, see, you can see that in many places here, including the salinity field. The, 
the sea surface temperature in, is interesting. It's you, you begin to see the intrusion, but it doesn't sort of work its way across like it does uh, in all three of these fields. Uh, in sea surface temperature, the uh, the Gulf Stream, of course, is for, is tracking the front, so, so to say, which is shown by the uh, the dashed line, and. Uh, interesting to watch what happens to the subpolar gyre before the gulf stream excurve, before the gulf stream is robust the subpolar gyre is cold and by the end of the 10 year period the subpolar gyre is warming up principally through the uh, this detached section sort of getting entrained if you look at the uh, at greenland even when the subpolar gyre is very cold T minus 2 is the time when the low frequency North Atlantic oscillation, which leads by a year or two years, is at its peak. Low the North Atlantic oscillation, as most of you know, consists of a low pressure in the positive phase, consists of a low pressure over Iceland and a, warp and a high pressure to, uh, to the south. So let me quickly first show you that, if I can. This is the North Atlantic os oscillation synoptically. This is Iceland and the low pressure is centered over Iceland and the high pressure is to the south. The point I'm, the reason why I'm showing you this figure is this low pressure is centered on Iceland. So what are the, the winds over the Labrador Sea and on the west coast of Greenland are are northerlies, northwesterlies, coming from the north and the west. On the eastern flank of, on the eastern east coast of Greenland, the winds are coming from the northeast because the low is centered over Iceland. So the flow is going like this. And the, this flow direction so what I want to now suggest is that I want to track the temperature changes around Greenland. So the flow that is the, the northeasterly flow is doing Edmund down Welling along the Greenland coast and uh, right here and the northwesterlies are doing Edmund down Welling along the Baffin Island and up Welling along the Greenland coast. I can at least account for a modeling analysis must be done to uh, to sort of confirm this, but zeroth order understanding for me is this is Ekman downwelling, this is Ekman upwelling, this is Ekman downwelling, and I gradually surround Greenland with warm temperatures. This is going to be interesting for the phase reversal of the NAO, as I will argue in a minute. So these anomalies intensify, and there is a Baffin Island current and a and a Labrador current that also advects these warmer anomalies southward and around this time Greenland is surrounded by warm waters. What is this warming going to do to the atmosphere? It's going to increase the temperature in the lower atmosphere in, in the boundary layer, planetary boundary layer and lower troposphere. That's going to lower the pressures and uh, and, 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 and do something. So, so we'll, we'll come to that part in a second. So the influence of the NAO, first of all, the influence on the NAO temperatures is to surround Greenland with warm waters, which I believe is critical to the reversal of the NAO, as I would argue. Uh, this I won't spend time. Uh, these are nothing but uh, time scales. If I take the Gulf Stream index, the raw index, I do autocorrelation to determine its time scale from zero crossings of the autocorrelation. Uh, we'll, we compute the zero crossings at E minus 1 and at 0 and so we almost get the same time scales whether we smooth or not. The gray ones are unsmooth data, the black ones are low 15 smooth data. So as far as uh, the, uh, as far as the, uh, the time scale is concerned, you get pretty similar estimates from smooth or unsmooth at least for the Gulf Stream Index because it's a slowly moving thing. For NAO Index, it's a big change. All of you know NAO is much more on synoptic time scales. So if I 
low 15 does a lot of smoothing and so the low frequency NAO is nothing but the blue curve here time scales of about 9, 8 to 11 years. The raw AMO index is this dashed line, multi-decadal time scales. For the tendency, it is now decadal time scale, 7 to 9 years. And these are lead lags of the various things. And these are, I already noted visually, but you can confirm that the Gulf Stream lags low frequency NAO by 1.25 years and leads the tendency by 2 years and so on. So let's move forward. One can summarize the lead lag links of these three players in the subpolar basin. One atmospheric low frequency NAO, Gulf Stream which is a very well defined process and excursions and the AMO or the, the decadal pulses of the AMO. So Again, uh, nothing new here, simply a, a nice way to, uh, time is running counterclockwise. Uh, each oscillation is around 10 years. This is the low frequency NAO. Positive phase is solid, dash phase is negative. Phase transitions occur at A and C. This, the radial line marks the place when the oscillation is maximum positive. This is the low frequency NAO positive. It was leading the Gulf Stream by about 1.5 years. That's theta 1. Likewise, the Gulf Stream index was leading the AMO decadal pulses by about 4.5 years. And the key here is to understand how is the low frequency NAO phase change generated. How do I go from the positive peak phase to the negative peak, negative phase of the low frequency NAO? This oscillation is plotted in the center because in this scheme, it is viewed as the orchestrator of decadal variability in the subpolar basin. It is the inner gear that's sort of turning, uh, turning this thing. And if the understanding would not be complete unless I tell you, if I start off with a low frequency NAO, then you know what's going to happen. The Gulf Stream is going to follow northwards. Why is the Gulf Stream going to follow? a low frequency NAO because low frequency NAO generates lower pressures over the subpolar basin, higher pressures to the south. So you have Ekman pumping going on in both cells. I will steepen the gradient and sharpen the gradient and the Gulf Stream is the geostrophic response to the sea surface height gradient you know, through some depth. Uh, critical will be how do I do a phase change of the low frequency NAO? This, these are, so I, I've shown you the temporal lead lags. Now I'm simply try, trying to find corroboration in spatial maps. So what we do here is lead lag SST regressions on all three indices. Gulf Stream is plotted in the center because it's the mediator between the low frequency NAO and AMO tendency on the right and I have shifted these time sequences by two years or three years to account for the temporal phase lead lag. So I'm making it easy for the viewer to compare, the, to, to look, to focus on the similarities across the three columns because the lead lag is already accounted for by shifting these uh, columns in time. For example, this is T minus one year of the low frequency NAO. This is Gulf Stream is T minus two years. This is leading the Gulf Stream. The real lead is 1.25, 1.25 or a year and a half, but here we are just simply putting one year. Likewise, this lead is uh, with respect to is again rounded off. These are three indices regressed on the same sea surface temperature map. You can compare. This, this row, for example, you will see similarities across the columns. And it is suggesting that the temporal relationships that we found between these three key players in the North Atlantic Basin, subpolar basin, are borne out in the spatial maps as well. This is the part that I was referring to, which I will argue plays a key role in the phase flipping of the low frequency NAO. The positive NAO phase 
is already from Ekman upwelling and downwelling building up negative anomalies along, uh, around Greenland. And this is only a seven year span, so you don't see that develop here, but you do, if, if these columns are related in some sense by a phase lead lag, like you see how the Greenland is surrounded by warm waters at this time. Excuse yes. You, you are looking at sea surface, uh, sorry, you are looking at sea surface temperature regressions on the three indices that I've been talking about using 58 years of data. And all of them have, this is simultaneous with respect to the Gulf Stream Index, but I've shifted in time to account for the lead lag relationship so that you can compare across and confirm easily that things are uh, nicely structured. One can look at the sea level pressure regressions in the same format and you will see for example the, the, the climatological sea level pressure is plotted using solid and dashed lines. They are the same on every map and this is the Bermuda high or the Azores high and this is the Icelandic low. Uh, averaged over all the all four sea, all four seasons and then this is the how the NAO begins to sort of develop. You can see already here that the high level the, uh, the for example as NAO goes from low pressure from its positive phase to the other phase the high sea level pressure is coming from the eastern side. This is the last uh, slide, so we can spend some time here. This is the self-feedback of the low-frequency NAO. Around Greenland, you are warming the basin on both sides. From, from the NAO-induced sea surface, temp from the NAO, the NAO winds are doing upwelling, downwelling on both sides of Greenland and in the subpolar gyre. And that warming is supplemented, uh, if I can go, just one second. So the warming that I'm seeing on both sides of Greenland is finally supplemented by the arrival of this detached warm water that comes up along the eastern flank of the subpolar gyre finally into the subpolar gyre. So we think this is the rising uh, west to east North Atlantic current that's carrying the anomaly. That's our surmise. There are two or three references in the paper that don't address this directly, but seems to support that assertion. We don't have the current information, uh, you know, under. So, so that's the. Uh, so finally, the so, so now this is the low frequency NAO. This is simultaneous. So what happens simultaneously? The you have, you have enhanced westerlies in the subpolar basin because if I have low pressure, I have a deeper Icelandic low and a higher subtropical high. And so westerlies are intensified. The westerlies, intensified westerlies are cooling the ocean surface from increased latent heat fluxes and sensible heat and so on. And sea surface temperature is cold. And this is atmospheric temperature plotted this is, these are, temperature is shaded, zonal winds are contoured, regressions are on the NAO index from NSEP reanalysis. Because the sea subpolar gyre is very cold during the positive phase of, this is the simultaneous regressions of the NAO and you see, you see the cold sort of surface trapped here because the sea surface temperature is very cold. It's cooling the, the lower uh, troposphere or the planetary boundary layer and 
and it is warmer further to the uh, south in the Atlantic basin, I mean around 45 degrees north. This creates, it is interesting that the NAO which is related to storm track changes or is tied to storm track changes is creating a surface, is creating a temperature anomaly that further feeds back on the jet perturbation or on the storm track. This is referred to sometimes as the self feedback of the storm track or the storm track feeds, feeds back on itself. So this DTDY is further enhancing the wind perturbation which led to the uh, and that continues and then two or three years later the, the warm temperatures that you brought down on both sides of Greenland and the cross basin transit of the detached eastern section comes into the is entrained into the subpolar gyre. The northern parts of the subpolar gyre are now warm in part because of what low frequency NAO did to temperatures around Greenland in its positive phase. That is warm now. So those warm and cold and now I can use the thermal wind relationship and I am building out black is negative anomalies. We sort of screwed up here in coloring black is negative, red is positive. So these are now not westerly anomalies, these are easterly anomalies or the negative phase of the NAO. And that negative phase intensifies and then again the DTDY will feed back. So what I am, what we are suggesting here is that the, the low frequency NAO, but I can move to the conclusions and say that even more. Uh, articulately. First, decadal pulses are an integral and influential feature of the AMO. Typically a swarm of two, three decadal pulses in each multi-decadal phase of the AMO. But they, are, but they are seldom recognized or analyzed. Oceanographers know this much better than the atmospheric and climate folks because they know about the salinity anomalies or the great salinity anomalies and that there are several of them in the in a multi-decadal record. The pulse, the decadal pulse origin is sought in variability modes with footprints in the subpolar basin. One oceanic which is the Gulf Stream, important mode of variability in the northern basin and one atmospheric, the low frequency NAO. The mechanics of subtropical subpolar exchange is revealed from lead lag regressions of surface and subsurface observations, the EN4 ocean analysis. A lot is riding on this analysis for our hypothesis. And what did we do? After doing this, we looked at the Ishii data. Ishii data is another ocean reanalysis done in Japan. And the same subpolar water intrusions are present in the Ishii data too. So at least in two different analyses of probably the same hydrographic data, the feature we are focusing on is present. And so it needs more corroboration needless to say. The analysis reveals an orchestrating role of the low frequency NAO which has extensive geographical reach. Unlike the other two, low frequency NAO spans from polar latitudes to the subtropical latitudes in sea level pressure, in, in impact, it not just has an expanse in latitude, it, it extends from eastern half of the North American continent to Europe and so on. So very impressive geographical reach of the low frequency NAO which is what gives it its orchestrating role here I argue. The word I like to use is think two different the same low frequency NAO is doing equatorial downwelling of the Baffin Island equatorial upwelling along the west coast of Greenland and equatorial downwelling on the west coast of Greenland. These things come down to the southern tip of Greenland, get entrained into the subpolar gyre. So LF low frequency and a coordinated changes, it is the coordinator of changes on either side of Greenland bringing them to the subpolar basin in the seas around Greenland and these are surface driven changes because Ekman upwelling or downwelling, surface heat fluxes, Ekman pumping, everything is surface wind driven. 
So these are surface driven changes. And in the subpolar, subtropical gyres where ocean circulation and bathymetric driven changes. This is the part where the Gulf Stream as it transits across the basin or, or as it moves across is has a detached section because of bathymetry and then ocean circulation advection from the North Atlantic current. So there are there is a northern part which is coordinated changes in the seas around Greenland and a southern part in the sub subpolar subtropical gyres where ocean advection and bathymetry plays a role. Both of those changes come together in the subpolar basin. The feedback from influence of LF NAO influence sea surface temperature on the overlying atmosphere. These are the sea surface temperature changes on both sides of Greenland and this advected change here leads to the phase reversal. It is key to the stitching of this mechanistic hypothesis because we still need to verify this and, and model this. But the idea is that till you have a process that can account for, for phase reversal of low frequency NAO or built in phase reversal, that is how oscillation is sustained. If it is a standing oscillation, it is a different story. But if it is a propagating oscillation, then you need a process. So you start off with a positive low frequency NAO phase and built in there because of continental geometry and processes is a mechanism to bring you into the other phase. That is what is responsible for this swarm of decadal pulses that you see one after the other in the, in the subpolar basin. The decadal time scale itself emerges from the time taken by the Gulf Stream's detached eastern section to transit from the western basin which is around 40 north 50 west to the eastern basin, eastern flank of the subtropical gyre. And we looked at it from EN4 analyses, it is about 5 years. I have looked at other studies about the transit time from the western to the eastern basin in the North Atlantic, it is around 4 to 5 years. And so at least this is in sync. So I want to conclude by saying uh, that there are elements here that need to be tested, corroborated, but that is what all that is intrinsic to the scientific method. You make a, you say something, you develop a hypothesis and leave it for additional data to bear on that and to either corroborate it or to dismiss it. And so I think we are at that juncture, given the best ocean analysis at least that we know, we have put forward a hypothesis for a self-sustained decadal oscillation of the subpolar gyre. So I will stop there. The Argos float data does not go that long to allow checking of this uh, because it is only about 10 years or 12 years perhaps now. And uh, uh, th if you want to see the pinching, you need a long thing against which you can regress because what I showed you was a characteristic decadal fluctuation obtained by looking at several pulses over a 58 year period. To be sure, one can do a preliminary look and begin to see that. No, we have not done that yet, but something one could do in a preliminary sense. Uh, yes, so, so uh, then you say that the downwell, Ekman downwelling on the two sides of the Greenland played a really big role. Uh, can you say that, you briefly talked about that, can you say that again, why in the positive phase of a table you would have taken the downwelling? So, so the, uh, the the key to that is the oh here yeah. the key to that no 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 oh I went too far the key to that is here so if, I I don't know if you can see this is Greenland this is Iceland the low pressure in the NAO is centered over Iceland so I closed low sea level pressure contours here. 
So the winds are blowing okay. like this. So the location of the low stem calculator is significant role. What he, the question you just asked yeah. worried us for months. Till uh -huh. we went and said, what is wrong? Let's go and look precisely at what the structure of the North Atlantic Oscillation, where exactly is the low located. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, if you think of a big low, then you expect winds to be like that. So the low is of Ireland and it fluxes thing. So you get a sense that perhaps the, the Ekman downwelling, because now the flow is like that to the right, so it's downwelling. Sometimes you get, if I showed it to one of my oceanographer's friend, they will say, oh, it is, uh, you are slowing down the East Greenland current. That's no explanation for me. I mean, why is the East Greenland current slowing down? So. The appearance of the warm anomalies gives you the impression that the cold water coming down from the East Greenland current is now diminished. But really, it's the, it's the downwelling. Uh, so you get warm waters, and then you don't see the warm waters in the next year, because those warm waters are melting sea ice. So the sea ice melt limits the amount of warming, because you, are, you have uh, both processes going on. So, but, so winds are blowing like this. So along this coast, you have upwelling. Along the Baffin Island coast, you have downwelling and downwelling here. So your warm water is sort of uh, uh, cradling the southern tip of Greenland. And then this detached section comes back. And you have a, at least a hypothesis for why the cold gyre flips into the warm phase. So it's more like consequence. That's right. So the, the decadal pulses that are manifest in the AMO index are nothing but the decadal variability of the subpolar gyre, as we know from the great salinity anomaly, for example, which is a big part of that, which is one of those pulses. Uh, so these decadal pulses, it's like weather and uh, climate. The weather events are unfolding, and climate is a little integrator. So here, I we, we don't know how these decadal pulses and what their rectified effect is on multi-decadal time scale. That part I don't know. I think it's an interesting open question to be. But in context of AMO discussions, you know, is the AMO a natural mode of variability? Is the AMO forced by anthropogenic effects? I think the fact that you can show that there are these subpolar, subtropical uh, gyre scale fluctuations involved with a key role for ocean dynamics. I think pulls me towards more that AMO is a natural mode of variability rather than an anthropogenic one. So we have a last question from the Ryan point. Yes. <coughs> Just getting back to the Greenland um, uh, ideas. I mean, another factor which I think I see some papers is, uh, I mean, you get the tip jet, I mean, their terrain interactions with Greenland, where you get westerly flow and accelerations along the south side of Greenland, which can actually increase the upwelling. So I think another, another interesting factor, maybe uh, you know, some of the interactions with, with actually the, the terrain in that area. And that well, and that's very sensitive to the wind direction. So I agree with oh, the okay. statement about, yeah, it's, it's, it's really keeping track of you know, the, the Iceland low, which is just a mean anomaly here compared to what's going on you know, during the season, during a transition season, and, and figuring out what all these factors so are. That, uh, I, I agree. That could be important. But, yeah.